was telling me that uh, he can't grow a mustache, but he can grow a beard. Well, I can grow a mustache, but I can't grow a beard. I tried a couple of times, and my wife said, it's absolutely ugly, you need to shave that beard off. And so I did, and I'll never try it again. If you were in here a few minutes ago, just before we started, this computer went crazy. I don't know what causes it. For some reason, it started just putting nines in my slides. And I've noticed that it's duplicated some slides. So this may be an adventure and absolute embarrassment as we go through this. Uh, but I want to say thank you for being here. I know that the words thank you probably do not even come close to capturing uh, the depth of heart, uh, depth of feeling in my heart, and I think in the hearts of so many others. But thank you to this congregation. I appreciate it so very much. Second Peter 3, verse 13, But according to His promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. My lesson tonight has the assignment of looking at some of the purveyors of the doctrine of the new heavens and the new earth. And I want to get some preliminaries before us. These, some of these are not in the manuscript in the book. So you may want to jot some notes in in addition. But this is designed to sort of key our thinking. I want you to think on the word accuracy for just a moment. I have listened to hours and hours of podcasts, and I've read a great number of uh, documents online by some of the men that I'm going to be speaking about tonight. And I, I mentioned in my manuscript, and I think every, this is the sentiment of every single speaker, we want to be accurate in this. We do not want to guess. We do not want to have... I think so, or I, I surmise we want to be very accurate in the presentation of our facts. And so I've provided a number of quotes in my manuscript, and I hope you'll take the time to look at those carefully. And I think you will, by so doing, you will see that we have not represented these men in the least. They are claiming we are misrepresenting them, but I do not think that's the case. Uh, we need to be careful lest we start accusing some of teaching what they do not teach. And I've heard things bandied about that this man teaches this, this man holds to it, this man doesn't teach it, and you cannot use hearsay any more than you can than you can something that's undocumented. So we're going to try to refrain from making accusations, and that works both ways. I do not want to accuse those who are teaching this of teaching something they do not teach, and I do not want them to accuse us as the speakers in this lectureship, as the elders over this congregation, to accuse us of misrepresenting them or being dishonest or in some way uh, not presenting the facts accurately. I want you to think about the word association for a moment. Is this a fellowship issue? The more that I study this, the more I'm convinced it is a fellowship issue, if for no other reason than the fact it's dividing congregations. And there are people who are troubled by this. Uh, as to whether or not it's a fellowship issue, when you start looking at the doctrine itself, I'm convinced it is. The new heavens and new earth doctrine is a system of eschatology that is contrary to the Scripture. This system sets up an end-time scenario wherein Jesus comes to this earth. I want you to pay close attention to these next words, to sit on the throne of His glory. I took that phrase directly from the website of one of the purveyors of this doctrine of the new heavens and the new earth. They envision Jesus coming to this earth and sitting on the throne of His glory. Well, please excuse me, I think Jesus is already sitting on the throne of His glory. This is just a shy being what we sometimes refer to as premillennialism. Let me go back up here and finish this. Jesus, when Jesus comes to earth to sit on the throne of His glory and judge men, following which He will surrender the eternal kingdom to the Father who will then dwell with men on the face of this earth. And so when you're looking at the, when you're looking at the system, the system of eschatology, it becomes obvious it is, in fact, a fellowship issue. I want to just mention quickly my assignment. When Tommy wrote and asked me to address this particular subject, basically the assignment was to identify the promoters of this doctrine. But I could do that in two minutes and give somebody else my remaining 30 Nine or hour and 39 minutes. How long did you say I had? 
So I suggested to him, why don't we take this lecture, let's, let's look at the promoters of this doctrine, and then let's analyze their procedure. How are they thinking? What is the process that they're going through? And the more that I looked at this and examined the process of their thinking, the more I came to realize they violate so many fundamental rules of logic and hermeneutics that they ought to be embarrassed at what they're doing. And I hope to reveal some of that as we go through. Uh, I'm going to look at three things as we have time. And if you've looked at the material in the book, you know I just do not have time to touch on everything. And so I hope you'll take uh, the opportunity to purchase one of the books and spend some time devouring what is being said and how to answer this doctrine because it takes some close study. We're going to look at the proponents themselves. We're going to look at the process in their reasoning. And then we're going to look at the problems with their rationale. And some of this is going to involve a, a little bit of logic and common sense. And I, I've tried to simplify this. I am not a logician. I was blessed to sit at the feet of Roy Deaver for two years at Brown Trail School of Preaching and to hear lessons on logic. And I've tried to stay with that over the years, but I've also took some courses in college. But I am not a logician to the extent that Brother Tom Warren was, for example. But I think I can present some information in very simple terms that will help you to be able to see that their reasoning process is not right. I want to talk about a couple of abuses that they made. This is not in my lectureship book. I'm not, I mean, my, my manuscript. Turn over, if you will, to Romans chapter 8. I've written a commentary on Romans 8. I deal with this passage in great depth, but I've come to realize some other things about this passage since I printed that commentary. This, this passage, Romans 8, verse, uh, Romans 8, 18 through 26, is one of the key verses that these purveyors of the new heavens and new earth doctrine latch on to. And without exception, every single one of them sees in this passage some, some kind of a resurgence of the physical creation, as if the physical creation is going to come to life and express itself with great joy, uh, hyperbolic language and personification, of course, but it is a restoration of the old earth, of the, uh, the earth that has been turned old because of the curse. In verses 18 and following, I'm not going to take the time to read this, but the key verse, if you look at verses 20 and 21, for the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. Here's their thinking. This old world that has been cursed, when our Lord comes again, it's going to be refreshed all the way back to the pre-fall state. I want you to keep that timeline in mind. Everything from the fall Forward to our time is the curse state. Everything beyond that, behind that in our time frame, is where they are headed. A pre-fall pristine state of this earth. Now, I want you to look at the context of this. This cannot refer to the earth itself. This is referring to the church as God's creation. The context demands that. What is he dealing with in chapter 8? He's talking about the victory of the Christian. Chapter 7, he talked about the curse under the old law. Paul uses himself as personification of that old law. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I truly try to do that which is good, but it's not in me. And then he calls himself being uh, under bondage. That's not the child of God. If you look at chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore... No condemnation in Christ. Chapter 8 is a contrast with that cursed state under the Old Testament law that could not forgive sins. Now, when you get all the way down to verse 17, he continues to describe the great blessings that God's children who are redeemed receive. If you'll just skip 18 through 25 for just a moment and look at verse 26. The Holy Spirit helps us in our infirmities. We have the foreordination as God's people, verses 31 and following. Nobody can say anything against us. What is Paul describing in Romans 8? He is describing the blessings of the Christian living in the Christian dispensation. Now, will you explain to me why Paul would deviate in verses 18 through 25 and all of a sudden start talking about the resurgence of the physical creation? That's not in the context. 
And that's one of the passages that is so abused by these brethren. The other is, of course, Second Peter chapter three and verse ten, where you have the uh, the, uh, the the word that's translated in the King James in the American Standard as burned up, but they latched on to another meaning, and they say it's to be discovered or maybe redone or whatever. Those are the two passages. I'm going to suggest something to you. If you get a proper understanding of Romans 8 and 2 Peter 3.10, and you can explain it to some of these fellows, their house is going to crumble like a house of cards. Those are the two passages they have to latch on to and twist the meaning of those passages in order to come to their conclusion. Now, let's talk about some proponents. That was just some introductory material. Let's talk about... I, I can't see the clock, by the way, on this. Uh, I'll just... Uh, <laughs> Some, some proponents relative to this study. Obviously, I can't study all of them. I can't examine all of them. There are too many of them in the church, out of the church. But even if we just focused on those in the church, it's disturbing to me there is a growing number of good brethren who have held fast to the truth and defended the truth who are now latching on to this doctrine. But I only selected a few of these that are more prominent and are out there in the forefront pushing this doctrine. By proponents, I mean those who are actively teaching the doctrine. Admittedly, there are some who are still wrestling with the doctrine. There are some who are saying we're still studying it. They've been studying it for five years. They're putting out printed material on it. If you're still studying it, you have no business trying to teach it while you're still studying it. That doesn't make sense to me. By doctrine, I simply mean what's being taught. Let's talk about this word doctrine for a minute. When I address the doctrine of the new heavens and the new earth proponents, I'm talking about every state of the doctrine. They use different terminology. The restored earth, the rejuvenated earth, the uh, regurgitated earth, and the doctrine that says you're going to even get your cat and your dogs back when you get to heaven. It doesn't make any difference what terminology you use. It's still the same core doctrine here. It's a doctrine that says this earth is going to be restored and we're going to live upon this earth. And this is irrespective of their disclaimers and their claims. They will say in order to... And I'm not trying to judge the motive of any of these people. Well, what I'm saying is they're setting out disclaimers. When you say the new heavens and the new earth, one will say, well, that's not really what I believe. And another one will say when you talk about the rejuvenated earth, well, that's not my position. And that's what they put these disclaimers in there. And brother, when you, when you study the podcast and you look at the hours and hours of time it takes to examine this, it is a common thread that runs all the way through those who are promoting this, this doctrine. And even their claims who say, some who say, well, it's not a fellowship issue. That sounded like Rubel Shelley 25 years ago, didn't it? Or what about those who are saying, well, it's uh, uh, you, you need to give us time to explain it. That sounds sort of like Max King, or it's not what you think it is. I've heard all of this stuff before, and there's no difference between their claims and their disclaimers than there is in those who have gone before them in different areas. What it boils down to is one issue, one issue. That being whether this earth is going to be burned up as per the King James and the American Standard, and in accord with more than 100 of the ripest Hebrew and Greek scholars this world has ever known, who translated that word in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 with the word burned up, and they are now latching on to a remote meaning in order to push this doctrine. And we're going to see more about the mistakes that they're making along the way. Let me talk about some of the men that I examined personally. And I wrote every single one of these men except for one. I could not find an address. I could not figure out how to get in touch with him. Clint Brown serves as one of the elders and teachers of the Farmersville Church of Christ in Farmersville, Texas. He's produced a series of audio lessons on the Book of Romans wherein he actively promotes the doctrine of a renovated earth. There was no email, there was no phone number by which I could get hold of him. Wesley McAdams is probably one of the more predominant teachers of this doctrine right now. He serves as the preaching minister at McDermott Road Church of Christ in Plano, Texas. He's been there since 2016. He worked uh, with congregations in Midland, Texas, Arkansas, Hot Springs, Arkansas, and Abilene, Texas. He's a graduate of Ambridge University, and he maintains a blog page and podcast titled, This Scares Me, Brethren. This Frightens Me, Radically Christian. 
I don't like the terminology. Now, I'm not indicting his motives and calling it that. I just don't like the terminology. I'd rather hear faithful Christianity, true Christianity, sound Christianity. Let's use words that the Bible uses. But he actively promotes this doctrine of a renovated earth. I wrote him, and he was very kind to write back to me. We corresponded two or three times. I asked for permission to examine his position, and he adamantly denied that permission. But get this, he said, but you're welcome to put my link, link to my podcast on your examination. Now, Samuel, go try to figure that out. <laughs> Josh Pappas preaches for the Church of Christ in Laverne, Tennessee. He preaches most Sundays, teaches in several classes regularly, and trains developing leaders. He earned a BA and a master's of uh, a master's of ministry degrees from Heritage University. His teaching of the renovated earth can best be seen in an interview that he has with Wesley McAdams, and noted in the URL address in the back of the book. Jacob Rutledge preaches for the Church of Christ in Dripping Springs, Texas. Jacob is a 2011 graduate of Southwest School of Bible Studies in Austin. He holds the BA in Bible from Heritage Christian University, and he gave me permission to review his material, but he was not willing to see what my response was. He did not want me to send him a copy of my manuscript. I have known Jacob Rutledge since he was a teenager, very talented. He was when he was a teenager. And I distinctly remember, on one occasion, getting Jacob aside and telling him, you have tremendous intelligence and ability. Do not let it go to your head. Jacob Rutledge teaches this doc. Oh, and, 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 and um, to his benefit, he has taken all his material off the website, off his podcast. But when he sent me an email, he said, I've removed it, but I still believe that. So... Um, We'll talk about that more. Matthew Benfield prepared and presented his 83-page Master Thesis in defense of this doctrine, New Heaven and a New Earth, studying biblical eschatology. And his thesis was later published in a book called The New Heaven and the New Earth, Reclaiming Biblical Eschatology. I wish I had the time to review some of the material they've written in more detail. But my focus is just to try to look at how they're reasoning as they move through this particular doctrine. Now we're going to turn our attention to the process of their reasoning. And we're going to do three things in this section of our study. I want to look at a brief look at inductive, inductive and deductive reasoning and the use of logic. Now, this is not going to be a course in logic. It's going to, what I'm attempting to do in this text, this first part of this section, is to get us to see we use logic every day. We may not be able to put it in a if then syllogism or a major premise, minor premise, but you use logic every day. And we're going to take a look at uh, some of their, the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning. We're going to examine some of the more glaring errors in their reasoning process, things that stand out and are so apparent. And then we're going to contrast that with the process of reasoning by some who oppose this doctrine. And that third sub-point I'm not going to be able to get to. In fact, I've eliminated it from this slide presentation. But you will find in the manuscript uh, an article by Brother Keith Mosier in which he studied this doctrine of the new heavens and the new earth more than 20 years ago. And he gave me permission to put that into this lectureship in which he used a sound reasoning. And then there's a section in there by Wayne Jackson in which he used a sound reasoning. So right now we're focusing on what is inductive and deductive reasoning and how does it come into all of this study about the new heavens and the new earth, and then we'll look at some glaring errors. There are two basic types of reasoning. One of these is inductive reasoning, and the other is deductive reasoning. And I'm going to explain this to you, so don't get, don't get upset. Don't get nervous here, Tommy. Just pay attention, you'll learn. Inductive reasoning looks at numerous case scenarios and then forms a conclusion. The conclusion, that is the theory, is then tested to see if there are any exceptions. Please note here, when it comes to inductive reasoning, the conclusion follows from the premises not with necessity, but with probability. Let me just illustrate. You take, well, Newton took apples. I don't know how many times he tested this. Threw them in the air, they always fell to the ground. Threw them in the air, they always fell to the ground. 
Uh, if he did that 10,000 times, he came to the conclusion that probably every time I throw it up, it's going to fall to the ground. But he could not state that absolutely because he may not have thrown it up in the sky enough. That is what we call inductive reasoning. And I'll, in all the material that I read, these promoters of the new heavens and the new earth use inductive reasoning exclusively. I'll show you the importance of that here in just a moment. Deduction, on the other hand, is concerned with validity and soundness. An argument is said to be valid when the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. And if the premises are true, then the argument is also sound. This means that it is impossible for the conclusion to be false. The only way to dismantle a properly constructed syllogism is to prove either the major or the minor premise to be false. Now, when you combine the two, inductive reasoning draws the theory, and then you state that theory in a major premise, minor premise, and then you try to show the, the validity of the argument itself, and thereby supporting sometimes your, even your inductive theory. It's a point that also begs consideration here. And probably preachers are going to maybe appreciate this a little bit more than maybe some who've never studied about exegesis and eisegesis. There's a difference between exegesis and eisegesis in the study of the Scripture. Exegesis is the exposition or explanation of a text based on a careful, objective analysis. The word exegesis literally means to lead out of. That means the interpreter is led to his conclusions by following the text and drawing conclusions that are in the text and only conclusions that are in the text. The opposite approach to Scripture is eisegesis, which is the interpretation of a passage based on a subjective, non-analytical reading. The word eisegesis literally means to lead into which the interpreter injects his own ideas into the text, making it mean whatever he wants. Now, probably you've heard the theory behind both of these, but maybe you've never seen the actual words. One thing that I had learned is that exegesis, by its very nature, involves deductive reasoning. Exegesis involves deductive reasoning. Exegesis takes the text, draws the conclusions that lead out of that text, and I'll also suggest to you that the kind of reasoning in every single document I have read and podcast that I have listened to from those promoting the doctrine of the renovated earth uses inductive reasoning exclusively. That is a major point you need to put into your mind. They use inductive reasoning only, and they use eisegesis only. They do not draw out of the text. And not one single case did I find one of these false teachers using exegesis. One of the major flaws then, please catch this, one of the major flaws in the conclusions these brethren have reached is the very process by which they've arrived at those conclusions. They start out approaching the Scripture in the wrong manner. And I, probably I, I, I lose patience with some of these fellows who say, I studied this myself. No, you did not. Some of the very statements that are being made today were statements that were made years, decades, and centuries ago, as Brother Tommy pointed out Sunday morning. This is nothing new. This is the same old rehash to false doctrine that has been bandied about for centuries, and they've latched on to it again, and they're teaching what they want. Rather than exegete the very passage around which the controversy is raging, which is 2 Peter 3, they look at Old Testament passages and specific scenarios, and then they come to a general conclusion. They start with the Old Testament, they read what they want in the Old Testament, they come to a theory, and then they run over to the New Testament, and they shove the New Testament passages through the theory they developed out of the Old Testament. I'm going to give you some examples of that here in just a little bit. Having set forth their theory, they go to 2 Peter 3 and interpret the passage in view of that theory. They do the same thing 
with their examination of other eschatological passages in the Bible. And I grow weary, I grow nauseous with those who will take plain statements in John 14, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and on and on, and so twist those passages to fit their theory that comes out of the Old Testament. We'll elaborate on that a little bit more. Now, here are some of their glaring errors, things that just popped off the page to me. And one of these is what we call circular reasoning. Circular reasoning is a logical fallacy in which the reasoner begins with what they want to end up with. They assume that what they're trying to prove is already true. And the more that they can set this out in several lines in, in a convoluted way, the more confusing it is. And they're very persuasive in this, brethren. But when you start looking at it closely, you realize they are involved in circular reasoning. Circular reasoning is not a formal logical fallacy, but a pragmatic de defect in an argument whereby the premises are just as much in need of proof or evidence as the conclusion. And, the consequent, and, a, and as a consequence, the argument fails to persuade. Uh, if, if you could, when you read this material, if you'll take the time and just look for some of these logical fallacies, I mean, in, in a very simple way, I think you're going to be able to see through this false, false doctrine. Other ways to express this are that there's no reason to accept the premise unless one already believes the conclusion. Begging the question basically is the same thing as circular reasoning. It assumes that you've already proven what you're supposed to be proven. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. Here's the logical form in it. X is true because of Y, but Y is true because of X. That's circular reasoning. Now, here's just a real simple example. Evolution is true because scientists say it is. But scientists say evolution is true because it is true. Now, they will insert other lines, but the two out, basically the two ends of a reason, you see they're actually assuming what they're trying to prove. And the more convoluted they can make it and more lines they can put in there, the more convincing it may seem to be. Now, let's take a look at Brother Jacob Rutledge's article, and he presented perhaps the most glaring example of circular reasoning. He, spends a, he starts out by spending an inordinate amount of time and space in his article focusing on God's physical creation, and he's careful to point out that God, these are his words, takes the light in it. That is the creation. Genesis 1, 4, 10, 12, 18, 21. It is good. God said it's good. And his conclusion is, well, if God said it's good, then he doesn't want to destroy it. It seems to me that Paul said the old law was good, but he did away with it. You see what he's doing? He's presuming what he needs to, to prove in the first place. Now, uh, he then concludes with this. Creation is good. These are his words. Creation is good because it's an act of the grace of God. This is the basis for biblical theology concerning materiality. The material creation is an evil or useless, but blessed by God with a certain inherent integrity. God has no malicious intent for the created world, but wants it to thrive, flourish, and expand. What Brother Rutledge is saying is that he, God is not going to curse this world forever because He made it good. Well, if he made the Old Testament law good and other things that were supposed to last forever, you have to find terms by the context and by the overall use of those terms. Now, then, here's another quote from Brother Rutledge. Yet again, the question still gnaws at our curiosity. Why is God doing all of this? Why is he going to preserve the world and keep it? Look at the parts that I've highlighted. His purpose, then, isn't to create a testing ground to create bodiless, spiritual beings to dwell with Him eternally. He is working to create an environment where He can interact with an entirely new kind of creation. He's going to make a new creation. He's going to change the environment. Therefore, He's going to change the creation, and therefore, He has to change the environment. That's circular reasoning. Now, let's break this down and take a look at how this plays out. His first point. God has no malicious intent for the created world. Read that. And every time you read statements like this from these new heaven and new earthers, it is, when God has no malicious intent, they're saying God does not intend to destroy this world. That's what they're saying. That's their language. That's their terminology. His second point is God created a corporeal, spiritual person. That's you and I. 
when we're raised from the dead, will be a corporal, spiritual person. His third point is, God is therefore going to create an environment where he can interact with an entirely new kind of creation, that is, the physical world exactly like that prior to the fall. Now, I'm breaking this down to give you exactly how this plays out to summarize. Plank number one, watch the circular reasoning. Plank number one, God intended to preserve his physical creation. That's the first plank. If they put that as a premise, I could disprove that premise very quickly. God intended to preserve his physical creation. God will, he's going to preserve it. God's going to transform us to fit that physical creation. Therefore, God will preserve that physical creation for our transformed body. Do you see the circular reasoning? Do you see it? I don't think Brother Jacob understands these reasoning in circles, but he's doing it nonetheless. Let me give you a second glaring mistake that they make here. I've got nine minutes left. They redefine terms and meanings of words. In hermeneutics, difficult passages are to be interpreted in a lot of plain passages. Now, John Piper takes a number of passages and he redefines the terms. I want you to listen to some of this. He's dealing here with 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. And I put these quotes up from his podcast at 45 minutes and 55 seconds. Referring to 1 Thessalonians 4, all it says is that we'll be in the air in the clouds. Where they go from there will be 100% supplied by the interpretation of the reader. Did you catch that? Where they go from there will be supplied by 100% of the interpret, interpreter, the one who's reading. Now, wait a minute, but he's trying to convince me that his position is right. He's supplied one definition that's not even in the text. Let me read to you a couple of other of his quotes. Those who go to that passage have already defined what that means. The text doesn't say, then they go to heaven. I believe the fact, I'm still quoting from him, I believe in fact that Jesus does return in the air. All the saints will be called up to meet with him in the air, and that's consistent with the city that would welcome a visiting dignitary, and especially a king in the ancient world. And what are they going to do? They're going to meet him in the air, and they're going to bring him back to this earth to sit on his throne of judgment. Talk about him starting in the scriptures. But hey, I can you take his position. You can make it mean anything you want. It's up to the reader. Here's another one. This is the idea. Jesus is coming back, and the people go out of the city to welcome him, escorting back into the city of glory. All the past that says this, that we'll meet him in the air. Let's believe it at first. Why can't we be satisfied with what the Scripture says? Yeah, that's what it says, but I have to determine what is going to happen next by other passages. Well, I, I don't have enough time to read the rest of his nonsense. John 14, 16 is not much better. He looks at John 14, 16 where Jesus said, I go to prepare a mansion for you, that where I am you shall be also. Now, if this new heaven and new earth position is correct, Jesus should have said this, I'm going and I will come again to prepare a place for you, that where you are, I shall be. Now, ask yourself, is this a fellowship issue? When you change the words of Jesus and you make him a liar in John 14, you better believe it's a fellowship issue. That's why we're trying to deal with this and try to address it. Case number, study number two is Wesley McAdams. He takes 1 Corinthians 15 and he does a hatchet job on 1 Corinthians 15. I don't have the time to read his quote here. I'm just running out of time. It's in the book. But basically, he takes 1 Corinthians 15 and he, he, he changes that and so misinterprets it, making you think that when we're raised from the dead, you're not going to be raised a spiritual being. You're going to be raised a physical being. Like Paul described, we're going to have spiritual minds. We're, we're spiritual beings now, in a way. Yes, I'm spiritually minded. But listen, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was not dealing with spiritually minded people. He was dealing with spiritual bodies. My physical bodies. But Brother uh, Wesley McAdams so twist 1 Corinthians 15 is absolutely shocking. Now, I want to look at some improper reasoning. Uh, this is the second thing they do in their process. They improperly reason from the Old to the New. You've heard this, this statement. Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. How many times have we said that? 
the new heaven and new earthers, they say that the New Testament is the Old Testament concealed and the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed because they start with passages in the Old Testament, they come to their conclusions, and then they shove their New Testament passages through that. This is a quote from Duncan. He wrote a book on hermeneutics. Listen to what he writes. Many times the thoughts reflecting the future are presented in figurative language so that it's difficult to get the meaning. The symbols that have been employed for the purpose of foretelling the future are subject to the rules that govern symbolic language. And I would say the same thing. The rules that govern interpretation of Old Testament passages are revealed in the New. Before a person can determine the meaning of the prophet's language, he's got to see what the New Testament says about it. How do you interpret Isaiah 53 if you don't have the New Testament? But you do have the New Testament, and you interpret that Old Testament passage in a lot of what you know in the New Testament passage. That's a principle set forth in God's Word. 1 Peter 1.19, we have the word of prophecy made more sure, more sure, where until you do well that you take heed as unto a lamp shining in a dark place. Paul wrote that Jesus Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. I don't want to take an Old Testament passage, decide what I think it means without ever even consulting the New Testament, and then take those New Testament passages and shove them through those Old Testament passages. That's a serious error in approaching the Scripture. With what time I have to do, had to do, had left, what time I have left, which is not much, I want you to look at the process of their reasoning and their rationale. There is a science, logic, reason. There's thought verified by experience, and then there's California. <laughs> well, we're not talking about that kind of foolish reason. We're talking about serious reason. Thomas Paine said to argue with the person who has renounced the use of reason is like administering medicine to the dead. Brethren, our generation has stopped reasoning. They're not thinking things through. And that's why these doctrines crop up. Common sense is not a gift. It's a punishment because you have to deal with everyone who doesn't have it. <laughs> what did that old TV series years ago, Monk would say, it's a blessing and it's a curse. If then arguments, also known as conditional arguments or hypothetical syllogisms, are the workhorse of deductive logic, they make a loosely defined family of deductive arguments, if then statements, and then they draw the conclusion. The conditional has the standard form of if P then Q. I'm not going to get into that. It's, it's confusing if you can't. But I want to break this down in real simple terms. If it is the case that every apple I throw in the air will come down, and if it is the case that I have an apple in my hand and I throw it in the air, then it is the case that the apple will come down. If then. The antecedent is the first statement. The conclusion is what you draw. The doctrine of the NHNE implies several patently false doctrines. I'm going to give you one of these. I've got about five of these in my manuscript. If it is the case that the world prior to the fall, you remember I told you mark that timeline. If it is the case that the world prior to the fall in Genesis 3 was confined to and operated within the constraints of time, and if it is the case that the new heavens and the new earth will be restored to the pristine state that existed prior to the fall in Genesis 3, then it is the case that the new heavens and the new earth will be confined to and operate within the constraints of time. But if I read my Bible clear, time is no longer going to exist in eternity. Now, here's the conclusion. It is the case that the world prior to the fall in Genesis was confined to and operated within confines of time. A day and a night, moon, star, all of that, the circulation of the earth, all of that was within time. It is also the case that the NHNE advocates believe that this world be restored to the pristine state that existed prior to the fall in Genesis 3. Thus, their doctrine implies that in their new heavens and new earth, all the righteous will be confined to and operate within the constraints of time. And you could put that in a major premise, minor premise, to, to finish that out, flesh that out. And uh, the conclusion is inevitable. These people, it's purely materialistic. It's not spiritual in the least. So we set forth some proponents relative to this study. We examined the process and their reasoning, and we've explored their problems with their rationale. And there's so much more in the book. I hope that you can take time to get it and read it. Brethren, this is a dangerous doctrine. 
It's not a matter of whether you believe what you want, just don't teach it. No, it's, it's, I, I want to suggest to you, this is not going to stop here. It's going to continue to evolve. False doctrines have a way of doing that. If you doubt that, look at what Rubel Shelley taught. Look at what Mac Beaver taught. Look at what some others have taught. It is going, it's not going to stop here. It's time we deal with it right now. And for that reason, I appreciate Tommy and the elders for picking this vital thing and addressing it. Thank you for your time.